So I've been thinking lately, quarantine has made everyone in America feel like they're an overachiever. So you emptied the dishwasher. You outdid yourself, champ. Reward yourself by starting to drink at four rather than five, you gorgeous overachiever. Yesterday, and this, I promise you this is a true story, my 83-year-old father proudly told me that since quarantine began, he started this new meal replacement diet. So rather than eating lunch every day, he goes to the local dairy freeze and orders himself a root beer float. And guess what? This man has somehow lost five pounds, which I think pretty much tells you everything you need to know about what this guy's diet was like before that. So Ed Goldman, cheers to you, proud COVID overachiever. Maybe we should call them covert achievers. But we need to collectively just get a grip here. Assuming that someday things return to normal, that we get out of our houses, we take off our masks, I think it's gonna be time to recalibrate our national accomplishment meters. Remind ourselves what true overachievement looks like. And today's guest, Danny DeVito, is gonna help us get our heads back on straight. So let's get it out of the way. Danny DeVito's small. A rare genetic disorder called Fairbanks disease stopped his long bones from growing. And we've all read these studies showing correlations between height and socioeconomic status. The taller you are, the more you make. But you know who apparently didn't read any of these studies? Danny effing DeVito, that's who. This is a guy who got an Emmy for his work in one classic sitcom, Taxi. And this is a guy who continues to scrape the depths of degeneracy in another future classic, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which, if they ever get around to filming a 15th season and it airs, will become the longest live action situation comedy in history. He's done some great movies. He was in Terms of Endearment. He was in LA Confidential. And this month, he's actually voicing an animated dog in The One and Only Ivan, which is gonna be streaming on Disney+. Plus. Now, I have not seen this movie. I read the book, it's great, it made me cry. I know Walter White is in this movie, so that's all good with me, and Disney tends to be pretty good at making movies. Danny's also directed a couple of really funny movies. He did Throw Mama from the Train, he did War of the Roses, and he's produced movies. Pulp Fiction, heard of it? Aaron Brockovich, Danny produced those. Not only has he produced, he's reproduced. He fathered Lucy, who's 37, Grace, who's 39, and Jacob, who's 40, with wife Rhea Perlman. Danny and Rhea are still married. They don't live together. They still like each other. It's all good, whatever. It's not my business. Welcome to The Originals, which I'm so proud of this season is presented by Los Angeles Magazine. I'm Andrew Goldman. As an interviewer for places like the New York Times Magazine and Vulture, I've interviewed way more celebrities than I care to admit. And what I found was a lot of stars don't like to share of themselves. They just want to sell you something. So I created the originals to interview cultural figures who actually have something to say. Some have great gossip, other have access to grind, but let me be absolutely crystal clear. If Danny DeVito ever came to me and said, I want to be on your show, but I want to read the directions for urinary catheters, you'd be hearing a lot about loops and tubes right about then. But lucky for you, this was not the case. But Danny, if you're down, I'm down. We could make a hell of a bonus episode out of it. Danny DeVito, welcome to The Originals. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to be here. Well, you look very good, which leads me to believe that you haven't seen. People talk about the COVID-19. I think mine is the COVID. I've gained probably 20 pounds. I have. Uh, I, I, quit, I quit smoking cigarettes when my son was born in 2008, and I've started smoking cigars and telling myself that oh. it's not the same thing. Have you been drinking? Have you been behaving I've yourself? Been, I went... Th- there's phases. I've gone through, uh, you know, the the very initial phase was sit in one spot and watch TV and watch movies and and eat a lot and cook a lot of dinners and drink a lot of booze and doing a lot doing a lot of that. I don't smoke. I stopped smoking cigarettes a long time ago and cigars. I gave up ten years ago. So lately, I've been more conscious about exercising. You know, I do Pilates and yoga and um, you know. A, bounce around on a trampoline which is really the coolest thing in the world you can send away and get a little round a little trampoline for your we've got one of those i've yet to i've yet to yeah it's good what it it does is it moves the lymph around the lymph system we have the blood system and then we have the lymph system and so you bounce on the trampoline and it it jars all that stuff keeps that stuff flowing good and lately what i've done is i've gone on uh, the past three weeks i've done two juice fasts in between, you know, just go, there's, there are these places that are called, I think it's, I can't remember the name of a juicery or some kind of thing where they, they have a program thing. They send you six bottles of juice and you, and you just do that all day. 
I've been tempted to do this, but I guess this would be the yeah. perfect time because don't you don't you need to be? I well, mean, you gotta you my... gotta keep it. You gotta keep mix it up. You know, you you can't. But just do I mean, I, I hate to get graphic, but I mean, don't that I mean, if I ever eat juice as a as a close to fifty year old man, I have diarrhea. Is it all about the diarrhea? No, it's not that. I mean, you probably not to get into your, uh, you know, gastric system, but it's not going to happen. No, really? it's like, no, it's not. It's not about that at all. Well, I lose some weight. Oh yeah, you do. You do. You lose. You drop pounds. You, you know, even though you're couch potato. I saw what I believe is possibly your first role. It was a short film. God, you know, what, every time I, I do research on people, I think to myself, God, it seems like Hollywood is such a small world. Because you did a short, an NYU film for Martin Bress, who would go on to direct right. Scent of a Woman, uh, right. Midnight Run. Really good uh, director, Marty. Martin Brest. Uh, He's a, so he, you he, did, he did a, you did yeah. a short film for him, yeah. correct? Well, I was doing Off-Broadway. The way this happened was I was doing an Off-Broadway play at the Mercury Theater on 13th and 3rd. And uh, it was called The Shrinking Bride. And I had a part in it. And we were in rehearsal. Long story short, a teacher from NYU came to see that play in the next incarnation of it. And he was Marty Brest's teacher. And Marty was doing his thesis film for NYU, which was called Hot Dogs for Gauguin. And it was a real cool part of a, of a photographer who takes a, a really seminal picture. Could be a career break, a changer, a maker. It was a real cute little film. It was 15 minutes and black and white. In this clip from Danny's 1971 film debut, Hot Dogs for Gauguin, the ambitious Adrian, played by Danny, hatches an unlikely plan for fame and fortune. Recognize it? Uh, it's a Graf Zeppelin. No, Fletcher, it's the Hindenburg. Oh yeah, that's right. On May 6th, 1937, the Hindenburg was due to land at Lakehurst, New Jersey. Just as it approached the mooring tower, a minor hydrogen leak was accidentally ignited and kaboom! Now, it so happened that there was this guy, see, who was just standing around with his camera. He picks up his camera to take a picture of the Zeppelin Murray, right? When all of a sudden... He caught it! See? He got the picture! Yeah? Yeah? Well, that did it, man. Every newspaper and picture magazine in the world was banging on his door. He made a fortune. Fletcher, can you imagine what it would mean if I was to catch such a chance disaster on film? You'd make a million. You played, I guess, a bit of a psychopath and a real climber who saw that the guy that had shot the picture of the Hindenburg yes. became rich and famous. So you decided to actually make your own Hindenburg and blow the head off the Statue of Liberty the and nose, shoot it. Just the nose. But I did it at a time when everybody was having lunch. And they were all down in the basement having lunch. And I had time to figure it out. No workers in the building and the place was closed. So we put a charge in the nose. of the, And then, of course, you know, it was a really great film up until we had a major tragedy in our, <laughs> needless to say. Wait, uh, do you, there was a tragedy in the making of the film or? No, in our country, which was a horrifying thing. Oh, you're talking about 9-11. I'm actually talking about somebody, yeah, blowing up. Okay. Yeah, so it, does, it doesn't play as well post 9-11 as it did pre-9-11. No. And and your future wife was in it, correct? Where where did you meet her? Rhea, Rhea and I met actually the same place. <laughs> she she was in the audience of the play that I was talking about, where the um, the teacher who came backstage to tell me about Marty's play. I was in a play with Rhea's girlfriend Diane, and Rhea was in the audience to see the, that play, The Shrinking Bride, and that's where I met Rhea. We went to see Alberta Hunter sing at the cookery. And after the play, one night. Nice. And that was it. Love at first sight and all that. Pretty much. You know, what's interesting is that, you, you know, you did this, you did this movie, Hot Dogs for Gauguin. And then, of course, you know, famously, you, you get Martini in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, bo you're playing, these are both sort of, I guess, I mean, 
I don't know if they're, one is certainly mentally ill. I would say if you're going to blow up the Statue of Liberty. I mean, was this something that people saw? Did you have kind of this energy of like being able to play kind of off kilter roles? Yeah. Extreme, a little bit kind of like not your average normal walk in the door by a donut person. Yeah. I mean, it's like I, I've, all the parts that I played basically were like in um, on TV, you know, Beansy Marat in uh, Del Vecchio, my first time on television, I think, uh, possibly. Uh, I played a, a guy at a newsstand in Starsky and Hutch. You know, all these guys who are bookmaker, uh, safe cracker, uh, yeah, shady character of some sort. Somebody with like a twisted past. Or his twisted yeah. future. Did they see something Too in you, or, was this, or is, this, is this just a, a testament to your great acting? I mean, what was it? Why? Oh, did, why I don't did know. They... I guess it's both. Basically, <laughs> I, I my my first impression is like, no, like give him the like give him the the, the kind of twisted world. <laughs> He's not the normal person. Not well. Wait, come back because I like what you're doing, but you're not going to play that part. Gonna, there's another part. There's a crazy person down the end. You can. Get <laughs> <laughs> Here's a scene from Milos Forman's 1975 film, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. You'll hear Jack Nicholson as McMurphy and Danny as Martini. Now, considering how verbal Danny would be in Taxi and in later roles, it's really interesting to see him playing a part of a nearly mute character. In this scene, McMurphy is teaching his fellow patients how to play poker, using cigarettes in place of dimes. So Martini doesn't want to bet so much, so he tears his smokes in two. Make the bets. What's this? Make the bet. It's a dime, Martini. Bet a nickel. It's a dime is the limit. I bet a dime. This is not a dime, Martini. This is a dime. If you break it in half, you don't get two nickels, you get shit. Try and smoke it, you understand? Yes, you don't understand. All right, here they come, queen to the chair. I've read a lot about the making of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I, I think that the word yeah. that you might be able to use about the production is fraught. It was fun. It was not It was more of the fun than fraught. It was, yeah. because, I mean, you know, yeah, I read stories, and I, you know, well, you don't know whether this stories. is over-dramatizing. People have said, oh, you know, half the cast went crazy. They said you, nah. you had an imaginary friend or something, N- nothing oh, like that. Oh, I had an imaginary friend, but that's not, Is it, why is that crazy? Martini had, like, a lot of, Anthony was not as, you know, I mean, his friend was not like Harvey or anybody like this. It was like, you know, it was like a, just a, a buddy that he talked to. So did you? So did you? Is is that a myth? Did you have a friend? Did you? Did you actually? Did yeah, you, you know, I mean, you it's might... an actor's thing. You have like secrets. You know, I also read, and it's just amazing because I just watched the movie and it's so good. And I, but I read that that Jack wasn't talking to Milos Forman during the whole. Oh no, that's not true. Oh, it's not true. No. Nope. See, all this everybody stuff uh, got along. We used to have dinners. We had all the good things that you would have on a movie. We we showed Cuckoo's Nest in 1974, I think, at the Kennedy Center. And that was really, you know, we were being, you know, we were all, nobody knew who we were. We were in the audience. Milos got up and made us all stand up. And he said, these are all the inmates from the (laughs) Cuckoo's Nest that were allowed to come out one night to come to the Kennedy Center. And he introduced (laughs) us all. That's amazing. And we were all with all these people. All the all the Washington, you know. <laughs> I hope you were all wearing like tissue boxes rather than shoes on yeah, your feet. Yeah, we, you know, we all we were dressed up, but <laughs> we were like all there, and <laughs> everybody was there, and they all thought they were sitting next to interesting yeah, people. Easy. One night, um, we all drove. Well, not all of us, but Jack had a couple friends there, and Scatman and I, and Jack, and uh, a couple of his buddies. One uh, went to uh, from Salem to Portland to see a basketball game because you know jack anywhere you know you near near a an arena and there's a basketball game he wanted to go and this is really funny because he was a big star at the time i mean people knew him everywhere in oregon we didn't we weren't 
Nobody knew who we were. We were just friends with them, hanging out with them. People were, were, I was in that movie. It was really great to be with them. And one night we went to, um, of course, he had floor seats at, a, at an arena in Portland. And there was press and there were people and photographers. I'd never, you know, really one of the first experiences I ever had with that kind of attention where people were focused on them and chasing us and coming with, coming down the aisle with us. And we stopped at the concession stand and I said, I'm going to get, you know, what do you, what do you want, Dan? And I said, I'll, I'll take a Coke. So he and his friends, they've got stuff. They gave me a Coke that was like that big. It was a soda. And I was let the record reflect your, that's about 12 inches. It was that's huge. A big soda. It was a big Coke. It was like one of those large, and we walked down the bleachers with all the reporters and people taking his picture and yelling Jack. And all the players knew him and everybody. And we got on, we were down right on the middle of the court, mid court, right on the floor, of course, you know, right, right there, curbside seats right there. And it was my friend. I'd never seen anything. Any, the players were huge. I never saw anything like it. They were so big. And, they, and a lot of them were saying hello to him and the people who were with us. And it was so an exciting moment. To, the ref threw the ball up in the air for the first tip. And exactly as the ball hit the apex of the... I kicked over my Coca-Cola. <laughs> and the entire tub of Coke went out into the middle of the floor. And, and the whistles blew <laughs> From every fuck every place in the in the joint, and it was out of stop, and they came out with spray bottles and towels, and Th- that's probably and what everybody I would crawl focused, under the seat. Everybody focused on us, and Nicholson looked at me, <laughs> and he said, "You want another Coke, D?" <laughs> and I said, "Yeah." He said, "Get Danny another Coke." Oh. God, I have nightmares like that. So, so when you saw that attention for Jack, did you say to yourself, "I want, I want this myself," uh, you or did know, you say I mean, to yourself, or, "Did that appeal to you? That level of fame?" Sure. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. Did. Well, it's it was like, uh, you know, very attractive. Danny grew up in Asbury Park, New Jersey. Now, his father had a lot of jobs, but when Danny was growing up, his dad ran a soda fountain. So, as well as serving hot dogs and chips. He'd also sell what used to be called notions, you know, cheap comb sets and knickknacks that his father would buy in bulk in Manhattan and then arrange neatly under a glass counter in his shop. These were nice, hardworking people, Daniel Sr. and Julia DeVito. You know, you hear about a lot of people starting out in Hollywood when they're 5, 6, 15, 17. I mean, you were pretty young, but you had that was my, a small... That was later. Sh- later. How old was I when I started? <laughs> you we can me. figure it out. But you did have, I mean, I don't know how long this lasted, but you actually, okay, so you grew up in Asbury Park, correct? Right. But you had a job for a while as a, not a barber, but a hairstylist, correct? You learned. Yeah, my sister, my my oldest sister was the um, driving force of the family. I was about 17. I just got out of high school. I was going to go to college. I was trying to figure out if I was going to go away to college or what I was going to do. I didn't have a real thing to focus on. And I was taking odd jobs in Asbury Park, New Jersey, where I'm from. And she was in the hair business. She she opened a hair a beauty salon. She said to me, why don't you come to work for me? I'll give you a job. I got the place. And, and I said, what am I going to do? She said, well, you got to go to school and learn how to do it. And you'll come and it'll be a family business. And I said... You know, what the hell? She sent me to school, and I went to Wilford Academy, and she fixed me all up. And I went, and I and I studied, and I learned how to do it, and it was fun. And then I and I went to work for her. She was a, a task mistress. She was really Were good. You, uh, she was, well, I'm, I'm interested. So this 16 was 16 years who... older. She was 16 years older than I. And the, like I say, you know, my father was like a real cool guy and my mother was really cool. And I had a sister who was 10 years older. She was like a secretary. She worked at the, she worked for a, some government thing at Fort Monmouth. But my sister Angie was the one who kind of like led me into that arena, which was kind of fun because, you know, you get to talk to people, you get a lot of that going on. It's like one of the first, uh, it's a performance in a way, you know, you doing it. But you're also like, 
you know, she called me Mr. Dan, and I was like, you know, I was a kid, and uh, she did, you know, got me into, you know, was, I did all kinds your- of hairstyles, and at first she started giving me all the old ladies. This was like a real great thing. I passed my test. I went, did the whole thing. So she was like, you know, kind of phasing out a little bit. So she'd give me all her, she had a big clientele, basically with shampoos and sets. If anybody's in the business in those days, they know what I'm talking about. Pin curls, permanent waves, shampoo it's, sets. It's something you can smell. Of there's, a lot of, there's a lot of chemicals involved. A lot right? of can, chemicals. It's, a, it's very distinctive there was a lot smell. Of, you don't there was a lot of dyeing and a lot of like, you know, dyeing. Well, there yeah. was a lot of dyeing too, but there was a lot of dyeing <laughs> hair. And uh, it was a... Uh, it was kind of a trip. It was really a, a you know, a hell of a, like a, a few years I did it. And then uh, Push come to show, she wanted me to learn makeup because she wanted to have her own uh, line of makeup. Very enterprising, my sister. So she sent me to New York to go find a place where I could learn how to do it. And I found a woman and a woman said that she would teach me makeup and all about the different Queen Helene products. But I had her enroll in a school where she taught at night because I could only go at night and she was busy every night. But she said, if you come and you go, go to the school, I'll teach you how to do all this stuff. So I said, fine. It was the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Now, I had never thought about being an actor. I'd never thought about going on stage. But, you know, I'm a big fan, big movie fan. Always thought I could do it. I mean, God, what is it? You know, who are these guys? Why can't I wait, do it? Wait, I'm confused. Wait, the makeup woman the makeup woman said that you have to take my classes at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. That's where she worked. As a as a teaching makeup there. She taught makeup there, yeah. Oh, this is so interesting. Yeah, I wondered really cool. how this great transition came. Oh, it was because really you cool. went off. Oh, it was really cool. And I went and I would audit all the other classes. Like I just sit there. I really I dug it. I thought it was great. And there's a lot of you know, I'm like a teenager basically, 18, 19, and it's a whole new world because Asbury is Asbury. Your parents, I mean, before you were born, you seem to have come late. Yeah, I was late. They were in, they my mother was 40-something. They had a pretty tragic story. They'd, they'd, they had had a couple of They had an children American die. story. They're basically an American story. So my mom was born there in Asbury Park and in the 20s, and my father was born in Brooklyn, his parents came from Italy, and they they had the same, you know, the same thing. They had no skills at all, and they had no education, and they were laborers. So they went through very difficult times, as most of the immigrants did in those days who weren't already coming from some kind of educated spot. They were like, my father I used to boast about how he got it. He got to 6B, which was, I guess, that sixth grade, second section. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, my mother graduated from high school. But Did your father boast, boast that he'd gotten that far? Or what did he boast yeah. that he'd done well despite, no, he boasted despite only having... That, you know, he was, well, he, he was what you call street smart, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So sure. he, he was very, very intelligent and took care of his family. He had, they had five children. I... Two I, I never met were early uh, depression. One died in a hospital and one died from a whooping cough from a pandemic, wow. so to speak. And uh, that was a, a baby girl who was a toddler. And uh, the so story. So they got into nowhere, which is. They I did. Mean, nothing- the story was that people came to visit. Some relatives came from somewhere. Somebody in the visiting pack, people who came in, they were, they were coughing. And my mother and father recognized this right, you know, soon after they arrived. Obviously not soon enough, but they brought this thing into the house and the little girl got it. And this sounds familiar, doesn't it? This yeah. Is not, I mean, it's like, a, oh, yeah, it does. Uh, maybe it's like a reason that I haven't been out of the house for four months. I'm, one of the reasons. I think you have no, to be seriously? very. Seriously, do you think so? You have to be very cautious. That? Well, you know, not. I, I haven't thought about it. This is the first time I'm thinking about it. 
My sister Angie was closer to the, you know, being 16 years older. She was the next baby born. And then my sister Teresa. You've mentioned that Angie was somewhat of a, almost a mother figure to you because she was so much older. Yeah. Like 15 years older. So you must have been, were you a mistake uh, with your no, parents? No. I don't know. They never called me a mistake. They said that there was one one story that I heard that was kind of a funny story they used to always tell. That first of all, when my mother got pregnant, she went to her doctor. Her doctor said they give her a test or whatever, and I don't know what it was like in you know nineteen forty four. Is you either you either have a you're either pregnant or you have a tumor. Let's check this out. The doctor said, to her, oh, Mrs. DeVito, you're pregnant. And she said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I don't know if that's any indication of like, but it, it was a story they got that same laugh from all the people that they. <laughs> Honestly, when I was reading that story, it was like one of those, I've been reading so many stories like like Bobby Darren's, like Jack Nicholson's. And I just honestly wondered when I was reading your story, is it possible Angie was your mom? No. There's so many. No. No, it's not. It's not okay. possible that she was my mom. That's, uh, that's, that's, we leave that one for Jack. That's Jack's story. So your sister gives you this money, sends you off to New York, says you're going to come give back. Me and money. This she didn't give me money. What's that? She didn't give me this money. <laughs> I worked in the store for, uh, I worked in her shop for, a couple of years, a few years, and I did pretty well. You know, not, you know, like just for, for those days, enough that I could get hooked on something different. And the opportunity to go away, to get out of town yeah. and uh, go away to study something that I all of a sudden found very intriguing and fun to do. And that was, I sat in on these classes. I started reading plays. I had never seen a play. Okay. Never seen a play? Never. Not before that. Movies only. Yeah. And so I'm a, I'm a teen, in my late teens. And I go and I finally get to s experience what you call, it's theater. And it was great. And it was a real exciting thing and then i so i broke the news to them that i was going to leave town and try to get into the day version of the night school and leave and go and live in new york so presumably when you said i'm going to new york to pursue this that was said, like a yeah what are you gonna do well i'm gonna i'm gonna become an actor was that did that seem like a real kind of funny kind of thing? what yeah they liked the idea they did yeah. Well, they're in the minority then, because most people would say, oh, yeah. are, you out of, are you out of your mind? No, they were in the minority. <laughs> My gosh. You know, really uh, great. And then, of course, they came to anything I did, whether it was off, 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 off Broadway or a workshop or even in school, of course, they came to see productions. They would get in a car and the, whoever would come just drive up. And they were always very, very, uh, yeah, very supportive. Do you think that they, in their hearts, do you think that they were surprised when you made it? Made no, they it, wanted me. They really pulling for me at every turn. And and then, of course, when I got a taxi, because everything led up to that, whether it was in summer stock or children's theater or whatever you do, you know, as an actor to work through it, you never know when you're going to get that part, with what's going to happen. I mean, that was on... I did a Starsky and Hutch. I did a couple of little movies. I actually did a big movie, uh, you know, before Taxi. I did Cuckoo's Nest. They were all really good stepping stones and really great things. And every actor who's out there goes through the same thing. They are, you know, you get a, you might get a job that's really cool for a while, and then all of a sudden it dries up, and then you know, or you, or it doesn't go anywhere. Or if it's a if it's a, if it's a, a play. It has a certain amount of legs, et cetera. Every actor knows this thing. And then once, if you're very fortunate and you're in the right place at the right time, something comes that like breaks the, you know, you break through the ice. 
which was in 1978, that was Taxi. Danny broke through the ice playing Louis De Palma, the abusive but generally lovable dispatcher for New York's fictional Sunshine Cab Company, and he played this role for five seasons on Taxi. The show premiered on September 12, 1978. It was an immediate critical and audience hit, and Danny had one of those stories you read about. He basically just became a star overnight. There's a famous story about you doing Taxi. Uh, uh, after, so, um, okay, Joel Thurm is a casting director who was uh, working a lot at the time. I didn't have an agent. Uh, and uh, every once in a while, Joel would say, go audition for that. I went to plenty of them and didn't get them. It's like, you know, every actor goes through this nightmare of auditions. One, he said, you've got, this is something that's really great. You've got to go. And I had all my friends were saying, like, you know, movies are the way to go. Don't worry about television. Anyway, long story short, he sent me this pilot and I read it and it was Louis De Palma was the character and I loved it. And I I went in to audition. I went to Paramount and I went in and I didn't know anybody except for Joel. And I was in line with everybody else, all the other actors. And it was my turn and went into this beautiful office. And there was Ed Weinberger and Stan Daniels and Dave Davis and Jim Brooks. And there was a hot seat right across the, the room where, you know, that's where you go in to do your audition. And we should explain. These were all veterans. They had been on, was it? A, was it MTM. They'd been on, Mary uh, Tyler they, Moore. Mary Tyler Moore, yeah. exactly. So they were they were the cream of the crop. Of yeah, the yeah, yeah. Writers. They were the best. I didn't know them yeah. uh, from Adam because I had never seen Mary Tyler Moore. I don't, might not have had a television. Louis was a very particularly well-drawn character right from the very beginning. And I went in, I met everybody, and Ed Weinberger had his sleeves rolled up. He was going to be the one reading with me. Everybody was sitting down. It was a scary moment, which every actor goes through. And I, I had the script in my hand, and I said to them, it was nice to meet you, I said, one thing I want to know before we start. Who wrote this shit? And I threw it on the table. And and that was like, uh, there was a That's second. A big, that is a big gambit. It was one second where I, it was like a, a, a pause. And then they just, Jim Brooks almost died laughing. And everybody was. So basically it was one of those things where Louie walked into their office. And then from then on, I couldn't say anything without getting, I could say any word I wanted and get a laugh. If I said and I get a laugh, <laughs> you know, anything. Well, uh, was he rich, originally written? I mean, whenever I think of Louis De Palma, I obviously think about him in that cage. Was he written? Did you know he was going to be performing pretty much in the cage? Yeah, it was all in the script. And the stories I heard later on were that Louis was originally only going to be a voice. And really? then they, and then, then they put him in the cage and the cage worked out great for us. If you remember the pilot episode, I was ripping people new ways to walk in that opening, those opening scenes. Yeah. Banter, Nardo, Judd, everybody was getting the the wrath of this character out of the cage. And I make an entrance out of the cage. I've already been in the show breaking chops from the cage. And when I walked out, it was like, that was the biggest, that was a big reveal and a great blossom for the... Well, you got, it was a huge laugh and it was a huge moment and you're screaming, Rieger, Rieger, Rieger. Rieger, Rieger, and Rieger. Walk, and you walk out and the laugh, I mean, I guess the laugh is that that I guess people didn't know that you were smaller. Is that right. what it was? Yeah, it was, a, it was a sight gag. Did that, I mean, did that, you know, the, the thing that's so great about your career is that it's not, this is not something that really figures much in your later roles, but it was something that actually they took advantage of in taxi. Was Absolutely. It something that you were, was this something you were comfortable with? Oh, very. Well, I was always, I've always been the same. I'm not, <laughs> not, not odd that, you know, it's like that situation as odd, as funny as it is in that, how else is that situation going to work out? I mean, never get out of the cage. I'm going to cut out of that cage. Right. <laughs> to come to work or come home. No, it, it, it was fun. I mean, we, we, we played into it a lot, in, in, but never really, that was the only real time we hit it over the head 
because there was no else, nowhere else to go. I mean, well, you do that, that once. You want, you, once you're you out, wanted, you're out. You know what I mean? You want an I was, Emmy I was in, in the cage. Once I was out of the closet, I'm out. Do you remember? Do you remember? Louis goes too far. That was the year you was won that, an Emmy. I think it was. Was that where I put my hand on uh, on uh, Mary Lou's ass? Only after you spy her naked through a hole. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's a void. I had a hole theme. in the boys' room, looking through to the girls' room, or, or I, no, a hole in the in the work room, looking into the bathroom, so I could see her change. Uh, and I don't know if that would play today. It's an amazing. I don't. I don't know if they actually submit specific episodes. Uh, I think that I had read somewhere that that you got the Emmy specifically, maybe for, the, for your work in that one. I don't know. But it was amazing. And at the end, you're basically you never see Louis until this point. I mean, he's humiliated. He's lost his job. The National Organization of Women has come oh, yeah, after yeah, him. Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. it's a very, it's a very similar scenario to a lot of stuff that happens now. Although, I mean, legitimately, Louis probably should have lost his job and Louis, kept. You mean Louis was me tooed? So here's that scene from 1981's "Louis Goes Too Far" episode. In it. A desperate Louis shows up at the apartment of the company's only female cabbie, Elaine Nardo, who was played by Mary Lou Henner. Louis come to salvage his job after he was busted spying on Elaine while she changed at work. Now, Elaine demands to know if Louis had ever in his life been violated, like she had been by his peeping. Twice a year, I, I have to go get new clothes. And I... Uh-huh. I uh, The only way that I can, the only way I can get anything to fit me is uh, I have to go to uh, a men's store and walk straight to the boys' department and ask if they have anything in the husky sizes. Huskies, I hate them. (laughs) I, um... I don't, I usually, you know, try to go when there's nobody there, right? I go during school hours. But no matter when I go, the place is crawling with kids. Uh, I don't even look at what I'm getting. I just go over to the rack, take it off my size, and I rush into the dressing booth. The last time one of the mothers said, You're lucky. At least you won't outgrow it in six months. Did you say anything to her? I mooned her. Tell me about it. Yeah. And now, oh, now, yeah, that's my story. I mean, that, that... It is your story? Can you tell me? What is it? What's the story? Well, I never wanted to go to the clothing store because I always had to go. I was always a little bit heavy. And, I'm always, and I'm, I've always been the same... Well, now I've always been the same size, but I've... I once stopped, got to the size that stopped growing. But I did have to wear, I wasn't skinny. So I couldn't go to a store and get clothes right off the, the rack, right? So I used to have to go to the, the large boys department. And we put that in the show. I told, I'm a veteran of the, I mean, it was when I was a boy, but I'm a veteran of the humiliation of just being a boy and going to the Husky department. I told, but, uh, I told Ed and Jim, I guess, this story we were talking about it about it's always good to draw from your if you can yeah i don't know if that line was drawn for but there's a line that you use that you says when you come out in your corduroys and they go whack 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 and and one of the mo- one of the mothers says to you well at least you're not going to grow out of your clothes in a year like my kids yeah something like that that might have been their a- line okay. i don't think that happened to me literally but i told them the story about how i, I you know didn't like to go To the big boys or the big, yeah, as a, yeah. Okay, listeners, you've reached the slightly confusing super meta portion of the episode. So Danny's co-star on Taxi was the comedian Andy Kaufman, who in 1984 died of cancer. And yes, despite what you might read in the dark corners of the internet, this man is absolutely 100% dead. But on Taxi, Kaufman not only played Latka, which was a take on his foreign man stage routine, but he also famously made one guest appearance as his alter ego, Tony Clifton, this talentless Jack Daniels swilling lounge singer who was famous for his antisocial antics. 
Though all Andy's Taxi co-stars knew it was Andy under the prosthetics and fat suit, Kaufman never broke character and instead insisted he was actually Tony Clifton, real live terrible lounge singer. Much of the taxi cast reunited to play themselves in the 1999 movie about Kaufman's life, Man on the Moon, starring Jim Carrey, which also happened to be directed by One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest director Milos Forman. So Danny produced Man on the Moon, and he also co-starred in the film, but not as Danny DeVito Taxi Star, but rather as George Shapiro, Andy Kaufman's talent manager. As the recent Netflix documentary called Jim and Andy the Grip Yawn showed with never-before-seen behind-the-scenes footage, when Jim Carrey was playing Tony Clifton, he went so deep into his character that he made everyone's life on set a living hell. And all of his hijinks were assisted by Andy's longtime collaborator, Bob Zamuda, who, like Kaufman and Carrey, has been known to perform as Tony Clifton. So if you're not familiar with Tony Clifton's body of work, here's the Zamuda version of Clifton from a 1982 appearance on Late Night with David Letterman. Now, uh, Tony. <laughs> You are not a well-liked man, despite the fact that you came out here and pleased this audience. Um, well, you, you had some trouble on the Dinah Shore program? Where, didn't you throw eggs at Dinah? Oh, that's, that's not true. You know, they, they tell you, come on the show and make, make your dinner, make the food. You know, mm -hmm. you make the food mm -hmm. that you want to eat. Mm -hmm. You know, the celebrities come on and make the food, so I make the food I eat, the bacon and eggs. Uh -huh. And she, she was supposed to sing, you know, she was supposed to sing a duet with me, and she wouldn't. So I poured the eggs overhead. Well. <laughs> I was, bo I was bodily removed. Nah, bodily removed. I want to talk in a minute about Man on the Moon, which you produced. But yes. settle something for me. Andy Kaufman, Andy Kaufman is now considered a bit of a comedy god. And like in the vein of uh, like Elvis and the vein of Jim Morrison, he's somebody, there are all these rumors that he's going to come back. And and most of this is is because of his longtime writer and friend, Bob Zamuda, who's been, Bob Zamuda. Who's been supporting this idea that not only was Andy like, you know, the greatest thing that comedy ever created. He was an outlaw and all this stuff. You know, I heard Sam Simon, who was a writer on the show and eventually ran the, the show, say that Andy Kaufman, despite being portrayed by Bob Zamuda as the biggest outlaw and a guy who would make everybody's life miserable on tax, he was actually a pretty nice guy and he was easy to he work did. with. He didn't make everybody's life miserable on taxi. He wasn't that way. So he was not. So he explain was not, this to uh, me. Is, is the myth more interesting? And he was a simple guy. He wasn't a bad guy. And he was a uh, performance artist in a actor's role on a move on a popular television show, and probably would have been happier if he could just go out on stage and play the bongos and uh, go go to clubs and stuff like that. He probably would be. So Sam Simon, I mean, there's this whole legend that Tony Clifton, you couldn't acknowledge that Tony Clifton, the, the lounge that's singer. Not, that's true. The lounge, that's all the, true. The lounge singer character, you couldn't acknowledge that it was actually a different person and not Andy. But Tony Clifton was kind of a, you know, in, in, with, with the three of them, with Tony and Bob and Andy, they were like, you know, kind of joined at the hip, so to speak, because there were a lot of times that uh, Tony appeared and it wasn't Andy. Yeah, that was the big fake out, right? So yeah, that was the that was the the fun because Bob did a great, you know. Yeah, Bob did it totally did at a, one I, with in, Tony. In, in reading in reading his book, I I thought that if it had come out now and anybody paid attention to it, it would have been quite scandalous because Bob writes that during the making of Man on the Moon, a couple of times he dressed up as Tony Clifton and actually was filleted a couple of times by at the Playboy Mansion and elsewhere. By people who thought that he was Jim Carrey. Yes, that happened. That's a little, that's a little weird, no? No, it's not. It, I'll tell you what is not, not weird about it, is that Jim was like really into obviously doing. No, no matter what, he was trying to channel anything that he thought Andy would. Let's put it this way. Tony was the the one that would do things that were were offen was offensive. Tony was the offensive right. side of Andy. And Jim was trying to be involved in all that because that's like that, that performance art. And and Bob encouraged that, which was good. And everybody knew that he was playing both parts in our movie, Man on the Moon. So I guess what happened, I imagine, is that the Playboy Mansion was having a party and they invited Jim and Jim might have said, I'm not sure about this, 
I can't come, but I'm gonna. But Tony Clifton wants to come. According to Zamuda's account, Jim actually called and said, "I won't be able to make it." But, but wink, send, wink. But wink, wink. Nudge, nudge. Tony, Tony Clifton Tony will Clifton. be showing. Right. So everybody assumed that that was going to be Jim. Right. Right. Well, that's the way it happened. And then he came out of the car and he did the whole thing where he, everybody embraced him and and he took pictures with Hugh Hefner and all the girls were all over him and he met a lot of people and he was offensive as he always is, I'm sure. And they waited long enough for it to sink in. And then Jim said he changed his mind to come to the party. While Tony is still on the premises. Oh, so yeah, there's the Tony's big, like, still roaming around insulting So people. everybody's like, what the fuck? Then they throw what? him out. Who is this guy? And this poor playmate. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if this is going to be looked at by the LA police squad, but I don't know if there's like a thing about like impersonating... If there's a crime involved in impersonating well, nobody, a celebrity. I don't think there was a crime involved. <laughs> no, you would have heard about it if there was a crime involved. And so was Jim as Tony Clifton? Was he, you know, because I saw Jim and Andy, this documentary, which makes it look like highly unpleasant for those who were working there because yeah. of his process. And I wondered, was it? Yeah, but it wasn't. It was because of Tony. Because Tony was an asshole. Tony was an asshole. Pretty much. I mean, to everybody. So if Jim was Tony, when Jim was Tony, he uh, tried to uh, he tried to do it to the nth, to, you know, try to f- do it to the fullest, as you would say. Was this? A, did you expect that there was going to be a performance uh, of a performance art piece? So there was no sense of like the old Laurence Olivier kind of. When uh, Dustin Hoffman said he stayed up for three days and three nights on Marathon Man. Oh, it's acting, uh, dear boy. Yeah. Have you have you ever heard of acting? Yeah. Now, my dear boy. Now, no, nothing like that. Everybody was happy. Now, with it. now we knew Jim wasn't a good actor. We knew what? <laughs> Say that again. What? <laughs> ah, that was pretty funny. It was a great what? take. You did a great take. What? <laughs> I I was joking. I said. You said, was it about like a Lawrence Olivier thing? That's what it was acting. <laughs> we knew Jim We all knew he was a good He had to get into the part is what I meant. My inference was that he had to get into the part totally, therefore become the asshole that Tony Clifton was. I happen to think that one of Danny's finest and certainly his grossest performance was as Oswald Copperpot in 1992's Batman Returns, which was directed by Tim Burton. In this scene, Oswald ditches his human name and embraces his gnome to supervillain Penguin, and then goes on to hatch a pretty frightening plot. Hey, my name is not Oswald! It's Penguin! I am not a human being! I am an animal! Cold-blooded! Crank the AC! Where are my lists? Bring me the name! Oh, it's time! These are the names of the firstborn sons of Gotham City. Just like I was. And like me, a terrible fate waits for them. Tonight, while their parents party, they'll be dreaming away in their safe cribs, their soft beds. And we will snatch them, carry them into the sewer, and toss them into a deep, dark, watery grave. So were you eating, there's a few scenes, and you obviously, as a penguin per, what's that? Salmon. It, you knew where it was going. Yeah, It was salmon? I ate the fish. I I ate the fish. And people say, you, you, you ate a raw fish? I said, yeah. Did you ever go to, you Nobody's ever had sushi. <laughs> it's the same it thing. Looks, it's sort of denatured when you go to the sushi and they cut it up so nicely. You're holding a whole fish and taking a bite out of it. Yeah, man. Did you ever see Lifeboat? I did see. What happens in Lifeboat? It's a long time ago. What do they eat? They eat a fish. So no hardship there. This is not like yeah. your, your Hollywood hard- New hardship. New Jersey, raw fish, clams, uh, shrimp, it- crab, <laughs> marigolds. All right. Okay, so this morning, I have to tell you, before this interview, I was bawling because I'm reading this goddamn book about a gorilla. (sighs) Such a moving book. Yeah, the one and only Ivan. The one and only Ivan. It's a great one. And we've been working on it for a while now, and it's coming out, uh, I think it's all 
August 14th. It's going to be streaming. It's really uh, was amazing experience because it's like a kind of a movie that has, it's got a lot of heart and it's all about Ivan, the gorilla who was kept in captivity for 27 years and finally got free. And uh, it's really wonderful. I, I have a great part in it. I play his uh, best friend, who's a dog. I'm you an play Bob the dog. Yeah, it's great. Bob is a, Bob Catherine, is a great Catherine character. Applegate is the writer. And Mike White wrote the screenplay. And Thea Sherrick directed it. And we have great cast. Brian Cranston, Angelina Jolie, Sam Rockwell. There's a bunch of... Do you feel... I, I feel like, and, I, and tell me if this is not the case, that, that the best possible job is if you become established enough to be desired to go into a studio and, and just read parts and not have to go through makeup. I mean, is this like, is that the best? It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's good. It's really good to be able to do that. And um, uh, the woman uh, also wrote a new book, uh, the one and only Ivan. You read the book. You said you were I, I read that I was bawling. Okay, so the, she's got a new why book. Why do they always, why do they have to She's got a new book out. You should read. It's called The One and Only Bob. It happens to be a, a story about Ivan and and Julia and everybody, but also there's the one and only. Oh, Bob! It's all about she just the wrote dog. A book? Yeah. So there's a sequel. Yeah, it's really good. It, but the, the one and only Ivan it was a. There's a great. There's a uniqueness to this movie that you're gonna. Well, first you're gonna love the movie, but Am I it's cry? a hybrid. You're gonna. Yeah. You. Yes. For sure. Uh, okay. It's it's I'm a, ambivalent it, yeah. about that. No, you're gonna you're gonna definitely. It's gonna be a favorite of like you know lots of adults who love it, and kids who love it. But the really interesting thing about it is it's a hybrid shooting thing where you've got animated character. I mean, there's a couple animated characters. There's a mocap they call motion capture character, like the things that you see, you know, like. Andy Circus does or whatever. We didn't have Andy, yeah. but we had another. And and that that Ivan is the mocap character. And it's amazing what they can do. Sam Rockwell plays that part. And also Angelina is a, is, is an elephant. You didn't have to do the motion capture though, correct? No, I didn't. I just did the voice and they drew the the thing. The motion capture was done like basically they used a puppet for for staging. It's all just an amazing process. I loved doing Dumbo with Tim, and that was like yes. a really incredible um, process. This was even beyond the, uh, you know, because because of Ivan, because of the gorilla and the character that Sam Rockwell plays. So wait, so you got the best job. You didn't have to wear that ridiculous no. suit with the balls on it? No, I didn't have to. But Sam Rockwell, I mean, because the no, best Sam job is you- No, Sam didn't have to wear the balls. Oh, Sam didn't- no, he didn't have to. No, he didn't have to wear the the dots. Because that seems like maybe the worst job is having to show up to work in one Except of those green things. Except if you're an artist that who, who's very good at it, who they need to get more recognition. These guys. Back in 2006, the right after the first season of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia aired, the president of the FX network told the star and creator of the show, Rob McElhaney, that they really needed to do something about the show's terrible ratings. In fact, he had an idea. They needed a star, a star like Danny DeVito to attract some eyeballs. No way, said McElhaney. No way, no how, no DeVito, never. Okay, Rob, the president of the network said. Then you're canceled. Okay, McElhaney said, so Danny can work. There's absolutely not a soul on earth, including McElhaney himself, who would now say that the show wasn't dramatically improved by Danny DeVito playing Frank Reynolds, father to scheming, morals-free siblings, Dennis and Sweet D. Reynolds, who are played by Caitlin Olson and Glenn Howerton. So I have to talk about It's Always Sunny, because I was watching it this morning. I can't believe that I had never seen It's a Sunny Christmas before. This is the first time I saw it. And I said to my, my kids are nine and 11. And I said, They've seen I, it. Di I would die to show this to my kids, but it would scar them for life. I can't wait until my kids are old enough to watch It's a Sunny Christmas. And I'm watching this thing. And this is a scene in which you are sewn into a leather sofa. It's like a take on a Christmas carol. You're sewn into a leather sofa. You seem to have been lubricated beforehand. You're nude. The part about the lubrication is like that... Uh in theory, you're supposed to believe that I was sewn into the leather sofa and it got so hot in there.
that I had to take my clothes off. And then it still was bursting hot. So it was like in a kind of a sweat lodge in the, in a leather sofa. So when I come out, I am covered with sweat. Like, uh, it's like a newborn halibut. Is there a man on that couch? <laughs> what are you saying, a man on a couch? Hello. <laughs> That's absurd. Now, I believe there's a man in that couch right there. There is no man. There's no man. Say some things about Frank Reynolds. Say them loud and make sure that they're horrible, horrible things. Yeah. And then we'll deal with the man in the couch. Yeah. Okay, so there is a man in the couch. All right, just call Frank Reynolds an asshole. Who is Frank Reynolds? He's the man in the couch. Oh, my God. What are you people doing? Well, you just no. say something about Frank that's horrible. Call him an asshole. Frank Reynolds is an asshole. Oh, Thank you. Oh, God. Oh, 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 great. Now you... Oh, 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 can't breathe. Too hot. Make it, Frank. I'm too hot. Let the couch. Okay, but did you hear she called uh, you an asshole? She called you yeah, an asshole, yeah. Frank. No, no, no. You are you are basically birthed at whatever your age is out of like a Jennifer convertible. Your head comes through this thing like a a a a like a furniture store vagina and you come out stark naked in the middle of a party well that was a lot of fun because that was kind of like the ghost of christmas past i'm supposed to be like hearing what people are saying about me that's why i was hiding in the couch yeah. so i was supposed to be hearing all these scathing things the, the way people really think of frank reynolds and we and there's a lovely long shot of your bare bottom which yeah. uh, i felt like was impressive not yeah. not a double oh no that no, that was me. The fun thing is that we didn't do just one take. That's I saw an outtake where Sweet D can't speak herself. <laughs> she couldn't speak. Yeah. Now, was she not imagining that you were going to be coming out? See, you well, can't she knew I was coming the... out naked. She just didn't know what to expect. <laughs> and I was wondering when I watched that, did they have to bring in another sofa? Did they re-sew the sofa so you could yeah, be Yeah, no, they had another. They had another thing that fit in there. And then we, they just carved through it. They carved through it from the, it came out the slit. And I thought to myself, I thought to myself, is there anything they ever asked Danny DeVito? I mean, first of all, it's hysterically funny. But second of all, I wonder if the producers or the writers ever asked Danny DeVito to do something and he was just like, nah, too far. Has there been anything? Not really. Not that they really wanted to do. I usually say yes to... Things like they've intimated and they've done things that they threatened because everybody kind of thinks of how to expand the envelope, so to speak. And so they've come up with things that were so ridiculous that... Tell me. Give me you no, know, it's just like, you know, just hard to go into. It's hard to imagine there's anything... I do have to. I I I have to check out. I, I'm afraid to say. I, I'm set. Sorry to say, I haven't seen the episode. But you apparently waterboard your daughter, Sweet D, in a urinal. Yeah. Yeah. You were like, bring it. Yeah. Well, you gotta watch. It's a good episode. Uh, it was down. It was during the time when uh, you know. Yeah, we. Did, I did it. I did it. It was a uh, fun. It's a crazy episode. Here's said scene from The Gang Solves the Gas Crisis from Sonny's fourth season. I'm not going to tell you the whole plot of the show, but it involves one character trying to resell gasoline. It involves a couple of other characters trying to prevent their inheritance from being used to fund the construction of a Muslim community center. And it also involves the appearance of Frank Reynolds' quote-unquote rape van. Man, that Muslim guy was going to rub me out. And that's when you jumped out of the van after I got out. Admit it. Come on. Oh, my God. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, don't worry. No, Come on. Okay, admit it. Okay, admit it. Okay, I admit it. What do you admit? I admit anything you want to hear. Now, you admit that Bruce <sighs> Mathis is a terrorist. He's a terrorist. And that you are it is, uh, you know, I just saw that five episodes, and I was actually surprised it was so few. Had you know, they've taken five episodes off because everybody's going out and taking off things that yeah, have blackface. Yeah, that are. And I thought, I think you guys might have the record. I think that uh, four was the other one. The uh, what's the show with Alec Baldwin? The oh yeah, 30, 30 Rock pulled four episodes. 
Right. But I just thought it was so interesting that, I mean, if you took everything from it's, it's always sunny that was like socially well, wrong right. or offensive, you, there would be no show. Right. Well, we, we have to keep pro- provoking, but there is a limit. How have you maintained, I mean, 14 seasons? Everybody thinks the taxi is this classic, classic show. What was it? Five seasons? Ta- is that what it was? We could do this forever, the show. Could you really? I, I mean, could. I, you have to have that unity, right? You can't lose anybody. It's funny. Mary Lou Henner said that of Taxi, she said, you were the only person who, if if you left, the show would not have survived, that you were the center. I don't, I don't know if you agree with that or yeah, not. I don't know. But, but, I, but the idea is that we we still like, uh, especially, well, even the Taxi crew cast, we all dig each other. We got canceled by networks. We wouldn't have. We would never left the the show. We kept we we loved each other. Same, you know. I mean, it's just we had a lot of fun. So what the hell? Yeah. You go to work every day with with a bunch of people that you really like, and what are you doing? You're making people laugh. Hopefully, you're having a lot. You know, a good time. It's a great living. Come on. That's got to be hard to turn down. No, I mean, yeah, you don't want to turn now. I I recommend every actor out there. Look, it's good to do theater. It's good to do movies. It's good to do everything. If you can find a bunch of people to work with on a television show, do it, man. Have some fun. You have, a, you have an extraordinary bar behind you. It's making me yeah. Crazy. Yeah. All right. I, I, so, Andy, I, I so- did that also. I stopped, uh, you know, even though it's it's sitting there, I did that also. I I took two weeks now, maybe two or three weeks, where I, because I was having a cocktail every night. You know, yep. just figuring oh, yeah. like what, you know, it's, I couldn't wait for five o'clock. I was just going to like, you know, like sometimes would be earlier. And I, you know, go from the, you know, I, I drink gin and, and usually drink gin and lime. I squeeze half and half, put it in a shaker. It's like a, you know, daiquiri, but only without the sugar in it. No sugar. You know, just, just gin and lime. And then sometimes I'll, you know, if I'm gin, quick gin and tonic, this, that. So every night I was doing a different, you know, do a margarita, do a Manhattan, rum and Coke, do the, any, any, you know. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, so it got to be like, what the hell, man? Every night I'm, well, I never drink every night. The last couple of weeks, I've been doing it like very, very little, like one, you know, skip two, three days. And I just got some um, uh, coconut stuff for, so I'm going to make a pina colada next. Oh. You got the the cream of coconut. Got the Coco the, Mo, Coco Lopez. Coco Lopez. Yeah, no sugar in that, Dan. Oh, there's a lot of sugar in that. No, I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not certainly not a, a health fanatic. All right, Danny. I'm, I, done a uh, lot yeah. of done a lot of crazy things. What do you Wait, got I, there? What is that? I'd never heard of it until you mentioned it. Did you used to have one of these? It's limoncello. Oh yeah, but that's not mine. It's I couldn't find yours. Well, we stopped making it, but it's uh, mine was. Um, in a black bottle with a, a little lemon leaf, uh, lemon on it. It's really, really tasty. It's good stuff. Salud. Well, uh, Let me see you drink uh, it. Go for it. Salud. Uh, salud, uh, salud man. No, I remember, I remember I'd never heard of Limoncello until you mentioned it on The View. You said that you'd been out with George Clooney for too lim- many lim- yeah, Limoncellos. The last seven Limoncellos got me. Yep. Oh, oh it's like a, it's, it's like a lemon. lemon dr- it's, it's yeah. You drink it after. I dinner. bet yours is. You drink it after. I bet yours is better. It's pretty good. Mine was good. I had a good one. Danny DeVito, I I can't tell you how much I appreciate you doing this and how much I love Thank your work. Thank you, man. Thank you for being on the originals. Thank you, man. That's our episode. One small note. Though I have never sampled the sadly discontinued spirit, Danny DeVito's premium Limoncello original, I cannot in good conscience recommend the inferior brand I ingested at the end of this interview, unless you happen to be some sicko who likes the taste of Pledge Furniture Polish. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked this episode, or even if you didn't like this episode and are particularly skilled in the dark art of deception, please subscribe, rate highly, review, and recommend to two friends, maybe even three friends. Could you please do that for me? Please. Please don't make me beg. Please don't make me drink any more limoncello. This episode was produced by myself, Andrew Goldman, along with my incredibly leggy and talented producer, Rob Heath, whose partner, Ruthie Ackerman, is at any moment going to pop with their first child. Breathe, Ruthie. Breathe, Rob. 
My advice to you and any other expectant listener parents out there, from my personal experience and my mistakes, your partner will never truly forgive you if you eat an entire chimichanga during labor and rave for hours after that about how great it was. I made this particular mistake. I still have not heard the end of it. It's been 10 years. Special production thanks to interview guru Fred Wasser. I want to thank Team Danny, and this includes Katie Feldman at Stan Rosenfield and Associates, as well as Nikki Allen Grosso. Huge thanks to the crack team at Los Angeles Magazine, and this includes Merle Ginsburg, Gwynard Stewart, Haley Eber, Jeb Perkins, and the magazine's Silver Fox editor-in-chief, Mayor Rashan. If you happen to want to own a print version of this interview with an excellent Chris Morris illustration of Danny DeVito, subscribe at a very safe social distance at lamag.com. The Originals is, as always, a highly replaceable production.